This is the final Arthur Shawcross episode, and it is much more detailed and graphic than the first. So buckle up, cokeheads. This is going to be a bumpy ride. Hi, welcome to True Crime and Coke. I am your host, Eve. This podcast is about true crime, disappearances, hauntings, and anything strange or unusual. I also drink a whole bunch of Diet Coke and pronounce most things wrong. Please check out my YouTube page and email me any stories at truecrimeandcoke at gmail.com. So, let's get started. Let me give you a super duper kind of quick short summary of part one to refresh your memory since uh, I didn't do it one to two days later as I said I would. So if you have not listened to episode one on Arthur Shawcross, I recommend doing so first. So here is the super duper kind of quick short summary. I believe I was four years old and something happened Then when I was seven or nine years old, my school records will verify something went on in the house. My mother had me do all sex with her, but before it was my mother, it was my mother's girlfriend who got dog with my aunt. A woman named Tina, I don't know her last name, I forgot it. Arthur Shawcross, also soon to be known as the Genesee River Killer, was considered very odd to his peers and relatives. He claimed many instances of sexual abuse from both family members and strangers, which turned him into a sex addict. Oral sex was his preference because after a violent rape, he couldn't maintain an erection if pain was not involved. Family members deny any wrongdoing, however... Through peer observation, he displayed many warning signs of early childhood sexual abuse. He also wet the bed into his teens, started fires, and abused or had sex with animals. So he completed the McDonald Triad. He dropped out of high school in ninth grade when he failed to pass the test to get in. And so he was not off to a good start for his future. He went on to commit petty thefts and crimes. He married and had a son, but she filed for divorce, stating abuse and sexual problems. Part of the divorce was for him to give up all paternal rights, which he did. Soon after his release, he met Linda, who he quickly married because he was drafted into the Army and sent for a tour of duty in Vietnam in 1967 to 1968. According to Arthur, he learned how to kill in Vietnam and claimed to not only kill 39 enemies, but he horrifically killed several Asian prostitutes. The army denies that Arthur ever saw combat, but at the same time, I am sure that if he did, they would deny it and just try to stay as far away as possible to being a link to a possible cause of his murders. After returning home from Vietnam, he was not doing well. A psychiatrist recommended him to be committed, but his wife, named Stupid Linda, did not sign the papers for him to be committed. Thus, he went further downhill. He had the same sexual problems with Linda and also beat her. She left and eventually divorced him after she suffered a miscarriage after a particularly brutal beating. After Linda leaving him, Arthur acted out and committed a series of crimes which earned him a five-year prison sentence at Attica Correctional Facility, which is in New York. During a racial riot in prison, Arthur saved the life of a prison guard who had sustained injuries. This ultimately led to his early release in October of 1971. He returned to Watertown to start fresh, however... At the time of release, Arthur's state of mind was the same as it was when he committed the crimes. No rehabilitation had occurred. His fresh start would not last long. After his release, Arthur moved to Watertown, New York, and worked at the local dump. He met his soon-to-be third wife, Penny. Even though Arthur's mother and sister recommended her not to, 
she married him. She became pregnant, and what I didn't tell you in the last episode is that she, too, had a miscarriage. I told you about the murders of 10-year-old Blake and 8-year-old Karen Hill, but I didn't tell you the details of those murders. Jake Blake's body did not leave much evidence other than the sign of strangulation. Arthur would later say what he did. With Jake at Blake, Arthur had taken him into the woods, and after stripping him, he made him run before sexually molesting him and strangling him to death. Arthur also admitted to cutting out the boy's heart and genitals and eating them. He returned to the body several times to engage in sexual acts with the body. With little Karen, he anally raped, mutilated, and strangled her to death. All the signs pointed to it being Arthur. There wasn't much evidence. So following a plea bargain to just a single count of manslaughter, he was sentenced to 25 years in prison. And that, ladies and gentlemen of this podcast, is where I left off. So now we can start part two. During his jail term in Greenhaven Correctional Facility, New York, Penny divorced Arthur soon after he was in prison. Arthur spent the first eight years guarding against harm from other inmates, many of whom considered child killers deserving of violent in-prison correction by fellow inmates, as they still do. Arthur's initial prison record describes his struggle in prison with numerous reports of fighting and refusals to leave his cell, but eventually Arthur settled in and was considered a model prisoner. Not the good-looking kind, but I guess the behavioral kind. Uh He would go on to prepare and take the GED, train as a locksmith, and take a class in horticulture, or in this case, horticulture. Uh Okay, sorry. He also had a pen pal relationship with a woman named Rose. A psychiatrist described Arthur before his parole hearing as neat, clean, quiet, cooperative, attentive, pleasant, no bizarre mannerisms, normal facial appearance and posture, self-esteem, self-image good, tolerance for frustration within limits, abstract thinking intact, no hallucinations or delusions, though processes logical, rational, does not manifest any psychotic or neurotic symptoms. So, after hearing that, the inexperienced prison staff and social workers concluded that Arthur was no longer dangerous based on that one psychiatrist's report, but they ignored several other separate psychiatrist reports that Arthur had unresolved psychosexual conflicts, continued to deflect blame elsewhere, and would continue to be a danger to society. After serving a mere 14 years and six months in prison for murdering two children, Arthur Shawcross was released on parole in April of 1987. Although Arthur had been released, his parole conditions were strict. He had to stay within a certain county and indoors between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m., avoid alcohol, avoid anyone below the age of 18, and avoid schools or any place where he would come in contact with children. But society was not willing to take Arthur back. The residents of Watertown refused to let Arthur live in their midst, so he was placed in the Binghamton area. But the residents objected to his presence. He was then moved to Delhi, New York, India, where he moved into the apartment of his former pen pal, now girlfriend, Rosie Wally. With my... Wife, Rose, even with when I was with Clara, I would, I could keep an erection, but I couldn't have an orgasm for some reason. Maybe in the back of my head, it was thinking about my mother belittling me all the time, and it just stopped me. That was, you know, what? Yeah, everybody does it. I keep telling Clara, I said, when I go back to the block, I'm going to put on my Michael Jackson record. He did it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have no problem now. Once again, the residents of the area asked Arthur to leave. 
The couple moved or really hid in the basement of the Baptist Church in Delhi until moving to Fleischmann's. But Arthur was again recognized at the local post office and an angry mob led by the town mayor came to his house and demanded Arthur's immediate departure. So they had to move again and after kind of shuffling around here and there, they got an apartment in Rochester, New York which is ironically where I am right now as I record this, visiting family. Good old Rochester, a city alive with music and a higher than normal crime rate. It is notorious for perpetrators getting away with murder because witnesses are too scared to come forward. I know this from firsthand experience that maybe someday I will tell you. According to Arthur, he and Rose got tired of the parole board's interference and found an apartment for themselves, got jobs, and settled. His life seemed stable enough until Christmas 1987 when he asked his family to come to Rochester to meet Rose, and they refused. His mood darkened when his sister informed him that the family had visited her in Virginia and returned the Christmas present that he had sent them. He became angry and ranted about how his family didn't want him and went out on his bike and rode for miles until he cooled down. Shortly after the Christmas incident, he started a relationship with another woman named Clara Nill and often borrowed her car. For a year, he maintained both relationships, explaining to Rose that he was just being nice to Clara so he would lend him the car, which... Okay, look, I don't understand. It's crazy. There's, There are so many good guys out there that get overlooked while horrible men seem to get lots of lady action. And look, Arthur wasn't even good looking, so I don't know how he pulled it off. On one evening in February 1988, he rode his bike to Clara's and took the car and drove around until he reached Lake Avenue near the Genesee River. It was an industrial area well known for its prostitutes and drug dealers. As he drove slowly down the street, a woman called Dorothy Blackburn, or nicknamed Dotsie, signaled him to stop. When he pulled over, she asked him if he wanted a date. He agreed and she directed him to a car park behind a warehouse. He told her that he wanted to have mutual oral sex and paid her $30. She then undressed and complied with his request. Shell Cross later described that, at that point, the woman bit him on the penis, drawing blood. He said he became incensed and bit her vagina in retribution and squeezed her throat until she lost consciousness. He then attempted to stem the flow of blood from his damaged organ and tied the woman up with articles of her clothing before driving out of town along State Route 104 to an area in Northampton Park called Salmon River, one of his favorite fishing spots. He told her that he was going to rape her and she began taunting him and calling him names. He threatened to kill her, but she continued the name-calling until he took her neck in his hands and crushed the breath out of her. He sat in the car with her body until nearly midnight, then calmly carried her through the snow to the river bridge and dropped her body into the icy river below. He walked back to the car, he drove back into Rochester, and drove up and down Lake Avenue looking for any sign that indicated that Dotsie had been missed. Satisfied that he hadn't been observed, he went to a nearby coffee shop to relax. After an hour or so, he returned to the car, collected the woman's clothes and other property, and threw them into a dumpster bin. The following morning, after cleaning up the car, he returned it to Clara and rode his bike home. Because of his normally erratic behavior, neither of the women in his life realized anything different in his demeanor. In the following months, Arthur became a Lake Avenue regular and was well-known by the local prostitutes as Mitch. On March 24th, police found the body of Dotsie floating in the river some distance downstream from the area where she had been dumped. Her body was well-preserved by the icy waters. 
but the water had also removed any evidence that might link her with her killer. The one thing that they did notice about the body was the chunk that had been torn from the woman's vagina. Arthur had contained the urge to kill for several months, but when his boss learned why Arthur had been in prison and fired him, it triggered off his next wave of violence. The second victim was a part-time prostitute named Anna Steffen, who Arthur had picked up and taken to the river near Driving Park Bridge. Arthur claimed she had offered him sex for $20, but when he was unable to get an erection, she began to make fun of him. He became angry and punched her to the ground. Trying to get away from him, she crawled into the water, but he went in after her and held her under the water by the throat until she drowned. He later told police that he couldn't be bothered trying to conceal her body and just let it float downstream. It later became caught up in debris downstream where, because of the warmer conditions, it rapidly decomposed. From that time on, he tried to resist the temptation to kill and got another job working nights. He didn't kill again until June 1989. His third victim was different to the first two in that she wasn't a prostitute. She was a 58-year-old homeless woman named Dorothy Keller. Arthur had met Dorothy when she worked as a waitress in a diner that he frequently went to, and the two struck up a friendship which had quickly turned into an affair. One afternoon, Arthur, on his way to the river to fish, stopped to talk to Dorothy. When she found out where he was going, she asked if he would take her with him, and he agreed. According to Arthur, they spent the morning fishing and making love. Until around midday, when it started to rain, they huddled under a crude shelter that he quickly built and shortly after got into an argument about her stealing money and about his relationship with Clara and Rose. He claims that when she threatened to tell the other women about their affair, he became angry and picked up a small log and beat her on the side of the head, killing her instantly. After hiding her body under a fallen tree, he returned home. He later told police that he returned to the spot several months later and removed the skull and dumped it in the river. Fishermen eventually found Dorothy's remains, but Arthur was never connected with the woman, even though he had been seen with her regularly and often went to the fishing spot where he had left her body. The next to die was another Lake Avenue prostitute named Patty Ives. He claims that she offered him sex for $25 when he approached the same diner where Dorothy Keller had worked. He agreed and they went to a construction site and laid down on a mound to pound. <laughs> Literally, they were laying down on a mound of earth and had sex. And then Arthur says that he caught Ives trying to remove his wallet and pushed her hard against the ground. When she began to cry, he anally raped her and began strangling her until she lay still. He hid her body under some scraps of construction materials and waited until dark and went home. Two months later, he killed another prostitute called Frances Brown in similar circumstances, except that in this instance... He claims to have choked Brown with his penis while having oral sex and continued to have sex with her body after she died. When he dumped her body down a nearby embankment, so much debris was dragged down with it that police thought the body had been covered intentionally. Following Brown's murder, the media began to pick up on the story of the murders of five Rochester women within 18 months, calling the unknown perpetrator the Rochester Night Stalker, the Rochester Strangler, and finally, the one that stuck, the Genesee River Killer. Some even suggested that the crimes were similar to the Green River killings in Seattle and speculated that the killer had merely changed localities. For his sixth victim, Arthur again chose someone close to him. June Scotts was a friend of Arthur and Rose and a regular visitor to their home. She was also mildly retarded. 
Shawcross had seen June sitting near the river on a warm November day and asked her to go for a ride with him. She gratefully accepted and they drove down to a local beach where they played on the sand and fed the birds before they walked to a deserted area and lay down on the ground to make love. At some point in their love making, Shawcross claims that he made an innocent comment about her not being a virgin and she started screaming. He then held his hand over her mouth to silence her but soon realized that he had suffocated her. Whoops. He then cut her open with his knife so she would decompose quicker and covered her with a blanket and brush and left her. He later claimed to have removed her vagina and some of her organs and ate them. Arthur was now on a roll and in the same month picked up Maria Welch from Lake Avenue and took her to a small beach near the banks of the Genesee River where they argued over a suitable price before they began having sex. Again, he claims that she tried to take his wallet and he strangled her. He later changed his story and told investigators that he had become angry and killed her when he realized that she was menstruating. He drove further down the road next to the river and dumped her body in some bushes. On November 11th, police investigators from the 60 Strong Serial Crimes Unit identified the body of Frances Brown. Incredibly, no one in the newly formed task force uncovered the fact that a known sex offender and child killer who was still on parole was living in their midst. Two weeks later, on November 23rd, while police were examining the decomposing body of June Stotts, Arthur killed again. As before, he picked Darlene Trippy up from the Lake Avenue area and drove to an isolated car park. After the money was paid, they indulged in oral sex, but Arthur failed to get an erection. She became frustrated and called him names, and he choked her until she lay dead under him. He dumped her body in the open woodland. That makes no sense, because if I was a prostitute, I would be glad that I wouldn't, I got paid and didn't have to do anything, you know? freebie. The following month, he killed Elizabeth Gibson in a similar fashion when she got into his car to keep warm while he was getting coffee from a diner. They had oral sex in the car, and again, he claimed that she tried to take his wallet, and he got angry and strangled her. Shawcross later told police that she had struggled so hard that she had broken the gear shift in his car. He disposed of Gibson's body in a new area near Wayne County, as he feared that the police were getting too close. Two more weeks passed, and even though the police were out in force in the Lake Avenue area, Arthur picked a girl named June Cicero and took her to another isolated area and attempted sex with her before strangling her. This time, he dumped the body off a bridge over the Salmon River. Two days later, he returned to the dump site with a small handsaw and cut the vagina from her frozen body and ate it. The final victim was another prostitute, only this time Arthur chose a black woman named Felicia Stevens. In later interviews, he stated that he could not recall any details of Felicia's murder, only that she was black and he had strangled her and dumped her body near those of Jean Cicero and Dorothy Blackburn. It was this desire to keep the bodies where he could find them again that led to his capture. On Wednesday, January 3rd, 1990, he drove to Salmon Creek in Northampton Park to visit Jean Cicero's body. He was aroused at the thought of having sex with her corpse. Arthur, obviously, had not been following the progress of the task force as they were the prime news on TV and in the papers. If he had, he would have known that police surveillance in and around the Northampton Park area had increased dramatically. Though Arthur didn't, many serial killers do like to keep up with the news and sometimes put themselves into the investigation as a helper somehow. But anyway, he was happy that there were no cars parked where he wanted to stop on a bridge overlooking the creek so he could view Jean's body while he ate his lunch. What he did not know was that a police helicopter that had been checking the Salmon River 
had not only seen his car parked on the bridge, but also the outline of the body under the ice. As the helicopter approached, Arthur left the area and drove along Highway 31 and turned left at Route 259, heading toward the town of Spencerport with the helicopter following his every move. The helicopter crew then called in two patrol cars to follow the car and intercept it. They followed it to an address in Spencerport where the car was parked and Arthur got out and entered the Wedgwood adult home where his now wife, Rose, worked. The police entered the home and asked the attendant about the man who had just entered and was told that he had gone down into the basement. The police followed and approached Arthur in the basement and asked for identification. He produced a photo ID and asked what the police wanted. Then they asked him to step outside to answer some questions. Later, he was interviewed in the car by Paul DeSillis, one of the task force investigators, and asked why he had been at Salmon Creek. Arthur answered that he had been out driving and stopped to urinate, but when he saw the helicopter, he decided to sit in the car and urinate in a bottle instead. For several hours, Detective DeSillis questioned Arthur extensively about his movements that morning, but found that Arthur had a pretty convincing story. While they were talking, Arthur told him about his earlier conviction for the child murders. DeSillis continued to ask him questions about his wife, his jobs, his sexual habits, and even asked him details of the attacks on Jack Blake and Karen Hill. Throughout the questioning, he was completely cooperative, even though he had not been arrested, and was talking to the police voluntarily. Later that night, he was released and went home, unaware that his house was under constant surveillance. The following morning, the detectives picked him up again to clarify some inconsistencies in his story. Again, Arthur complied with their request and went with them. They drove to an area near a golf course where he had a liaison with a prostitute. He had a liaison with a prostitute who had testified that he had often frequented the Lake Avenue area picking up prostitutes. When Arthur agreed with the assertion, he was asked to accompany the detectives to their office where an official interrogation was conducted. Later the same evening, Arthur Shawcross positively identified photographs of the 11 victims and confessed to their murders. He then accompanied the police to the various grave sites and late that night after 12 straight hours of interrogation, that's right, not gay hours, but straight hours of interrogation, Arthur Shawcross was officially charged with the Genesee River killings. At his arraignment, Arthur Shawcross followed his court-appointed attorney's advice and pleaded innocent on all charges and was strongly rumored that he would raise an insanity defense. For the next several months, Arthur was given a battery of tests by numerous psychiatrists, one of which, Dr. Krauss, compiled an extensive report which suggested that Arthur Shawcross was an emotionally unstable, learning-disabled, genetically impaired, biochemically disordered, neurologically damaged individual, psychologically alienated from significant others during his entire life, venting his frustration and rage, mixed with fear and defiance in a lifetime of ever more violent and destructive which eventually turned to overpowering murderous fury. <gasps> that was the longest sentence I have ever read in my life. The trial was extensively covered, but was actually kind of boring to keep up with because it was just nonstop psychiatric specialists, including Dr. Park Dietz, who was well known for his work with the FBI, the only defense witness was Dr. Dorothy Lewis, who testified that Shawcross had been hideously traumatized as a child, which had left him with a multiple personality disorder. She also cited post-traumatic stress disorder caused by the war experiences as a root cause for his behavior. Shawcross also sat in court like a zombie day after day, trying to give his impression of psychosis to the jury. He did not do a good acting job. He did not impress the jury, and it just took 
six and a half hours to return a unanimous guilty verdict and recommend a sentence of 250 years in jail. While Shawcross was in prison in September 1999, he was found to be selling his paintings and autographs on the internet from within Fallsburg Prison in New York. So Arthur, or Art's, Art's privileges were suspended. On November 10th, 2008, Shawcross complained of a pain in his leg. He was 63 years old, and he was taken to Albany Medical Center, and he went into cardiac arrest and died shortly after. He was pronounced dead at 9.50 p.m. Okay, so if you are not a novice true crime fan, you have most likely seen Arthur Shawcross's interviews on TV, and the most common comments you will find, like on any YouTube video of Arthur Shawcross's interviews, are, what the heck is wrong with his eyes? Why does he keep blinking like that? Gross. Why are there scabs on his arm? Why does he pick at his skin? Well, I have an explanation. With his eyes, those are called ticks, T-I-C-S, and picking at the skin also are what cause the scabs on his arms, and those are a sign of Tourette's. The symptoms of Tourette's worsen under stress. Tourette's can be hereditary, and it can also be a sign of childhood sexual abuse. In my humble, uneducated opinion, Arthur Shawcross became the monster he was through nature and nurture. I think he exaggerated his claims in childhood and Vietnam, but I do believe something wrong was most definitely going on during his childhood. Combined with being bullied, possible witnessing of atrocities in Vietnam, lack of professional therapy, and just being outright evil. Arthur Shawcross was created through both nature and nurture. Arthur Shawcross's early release after the brutal murders of two children is still considered one of the biggest miscarriages of justice in American history. No, I wasn't hunting women. I was hunting prostitutes. Why do you keep referring to hunting women? That's a misconception that's got a lot of women in this world scared. Even there's some guys in here scared because I was hunting women. I was hunting prostitutes. There's a difference. You would never have killed a woman. I would never have killed a normal woman. I'm sorry about my microphone cutting in and out. I believe it is the cord, so I will get a new one. So that will get fixed as soon as possible. I am sorry about that. Have a good evening.